Welcome back to this video series on the Unified Development Ordinance, or the Manhattan Development Code, as it'll be called once it's adopted. This video covers Article 4, uh, which we're actually splitting into two parts. This will be Part 1, where we'll cover residential design standards specifically. We're saving commercial design standards for a second video, uh, which may or may not be hosted by me. So look forward to that. So what do these design standards address? Well, first we need to know a little bit about what design standards are and how they work. So we established in the previous video, right, that zoning districts uh, will typically establish things like uh, height for structures, uh, setbacks for buildings, density, and determine what kind of uses can be established in a zoning district. And design standards add just a little bit more flavor to zoning districts, usually because they're in a special area or have special context that need uh, special attention. So they typically establish building and site development standards to encourage better performance of land, uh, improve quality and compatibility of development that's more consistent with community goals. So much of what we're going to go over today is going to go into topics that were actually discussed in the previous video covering Article 3. Um, so I'll, again, I'll try to spend a little more time on changes uh, to keep things short and interesting. So let's dive in. <laughs> So the first section in these development standards uh, covers the established neighborhood overlay district, uh, which we talked about in a previous video. It kind of went over the purpose of the established neighborhood overlay, um, starting with the history of what is now the traditional neighborhood overlay, which was established back in 2003 uh, to help address uh, compatibility issues with new development and additions that were happening in older neighborhoods of town, specifically as it relates to development patterns that we typically see with older neighborhoods. And what was really cool about this process is since 2003, um, there's been a lot of advances in mapping and sampling techniques that really gave us the ability to hone in on more appropriate development standards for this area, specifically as it relates to lot size, setbacks, lot coverage, and architectural standards. And I think our philosophy surrounding development in this area has kind of changed over time as well. When more modern zoning code were established in this area, it really didn't, uh, it really wasn't compatible with uh, this development. It was more compatible with new development that was happening at that time, which would have been uh, much more suburban in, in nature. Building set back further from the streets, garage fronting houses, much more larger lots. So it kind of left uh, the older neighborhoods in town in a place where they were no longer compatible with the zoning that applied to them. And I think our philosophy on this area has changed in that we're not trying to force uh, these older neighborhoods that have been around for well over 100 years, we're not trying to force them to become something that they're not. Uh, we're really trying to uh, accept them for what they are because they are now historic and, and we appreciate them and we, we want to continue to revitalize and adapt. Um, and so in order to do that, we need to have a zoning code that is more specific to the conditions that exist there today. And these standards that apply to those areas need to supersede uh, the base zoning district that would apply more broadly. So because the established neighborhood overlay uh, covers multiple zoning districts in uh, many different areas of town, uh, it has to address how different uses and structure types will behave. And this is reflected in a table found in the code, which lays out lot and building design standards. And one of the first things you'll notice in this table is that minimum lot areas are much smaller than standard development. As the downtown area was platted, a standard lot in this area was about 7,500 square feet. But what we find in these areas is that there are often much smaller lots, as small as 6,500, 6,000, um, even some that are 5,000 or smaller. And our approach to this is we're saying that's okay. These, these things have existed for, um, in some cases, over 100 years. And so we're accepting that condition by lowering that minimum lot size uh, down to something more appropriate. And the same thing goes with the minimum lot width as well. And what we find in these districts is that the setbacks for buildings are also much smaller. Throughout this process, we were able to use aerial data uh, to really analyze where buildings were in regard to their setback from, from property lines. By doing that, we were able to go on a block by block basis and figure out how many houses today would be conforming based on the current code. And what we found was pretty shocking. We found that only 53% of homes within the established neighborhood overlay were actually conforming today. We found there were a lot of different blocks with different setbacks throughout the district. So in some cases, there were entire blocks that were completely out of conformance in regard to setbacks. And we were able to adjust that front yard setback in order to uh, increase that that number of conforming. So we're implementing a system whereby your setback is actually determined by the average setback of other houses along your block. 
plus or minus, um, in this case, seven feet. And by applying that standard as opposed to an absolute number or an absolute range, uh, we were actually able to increase the number of conforming structures from 53% to 94. But in cases where there's uh, very few houses along the block or not enough to create a consistent average, um, these standard setbacks would apply whereby you'd have to be at a minimum at least 12 feet from that front property line with a maximum of 25 feet. And we can see the same thing when dealing with side yards that are fronting on streets, which is specifically an issue for corner lots, because currently we consider a corner lot to have two front yards, which is very difficult when dealing with front yard setbacks. And a major change in our proposed code is to be able to consider uh, one of those frontages to be a what's called a side street setback. And in classifying it that way, we can apply a different standard than we would. And we were able to do a very similar analysis, uh, sampling different corner lots to see what the compliance rate was. And by adjusting that side street setback to eight feet, uh, as opposed to the 14 feet that it would have been as a front yard, we were actually able to change conformance uh, four structures from 33% to 79%. Nothing really changing on interior side or rear yard setbacks, uh, no, changes, no changes in height. Uh, there were really no compliance issues there. Another main issue we found was in dealing with lot coverage. The issue was very similar to setbacks. Because this is an older part of town, uh, the lots are very small and the buildings tend to take up uh, a lot more of the lot that you would see in a more suburban setting. And our current lot coverage maximum is 30%. And when we sampled the homes in the established neighborhood overlay, uh, what we found was very little compliance with that 30%. In fact, only about half of properties were in compliance with that lot coverage maximum. And what we found was when we adjusted that lot coverage maximum, just 5% to 35%, that compliance rate increased to 88%. And again, part of our philosophy change with this was, why not? These houses have existed uh, for over 100 years, and when homeowners would come to us with a project, they wanted to do an addition or something, uh, very often they would run up against that law coverage maximum, which really hindered their ability to do these projects and to improve their homes in these areas that really need it. So by increasing that law coverage maximum, we're actually encouraging uh, reinvestment and uh, renovation and vitality for those areas. So site design standards are pretty unique for this area. The goal being for this section to conserve the traditional pedestrian oriented kind of utility of these older neighborhoods because they developed without cars in mind and, and that's really reflected in the architecture and in the site design where driveways are located where garages are located it's all there so today for the traditional neighborhood overlay we actually have standards related to automobile access generally access is only allowed by an alley if one exists there's a limitation on how wide driveways can be garages are typically located in the backyard of a property or are set back further than the front facade of the house. And so we have these standards for when modifications or uh, new homes come in uh, that they're not uh, grossly incompatible with that more traditional character that we see in these older areas. And so those requirements were not changing because most of those things are working well. One new standard is street trees. In this new code, we're aiming to preserve and in some cases reestablish the tree canopy in these older neighborhoods because they've become a pretty vital part of the characteristic of these neighborhoods. So in the new code, if a tree is removed, it has to be replaced and new street trees are required with redevelopment. Going in even further, we get to building design. The goal of having standards for building design is to again create compatibility and conserve uh, the more traditional neighborhood character that you'll find in these areas. You'll notice some common elements when it comes to older home architecture, which are reflected in our current code. In our study of the issue, we found that most of these things are working. So currently addressed in the traditional neighborhood overlay is building orientation. Homes have to have a certain roof pitch. We require roof overhangs. We did add some minor things and, and tweaked some things in response to the nearly 20 years of seeing new buildings and, and building modifications in these areas. One of those things was creating leeway for porch additions. Currently we consider porches to be part of the structure that need to be uh, set back so far from the street. Um, we're actually allowing those to be closer than they are today in order to encourage new buildings to include a porch. New houses need to include what we're calling visible foundation material uh, and this is really to avoid the slab on grade house look. We're not necessarily saying that slab houses can't be built, it's just when they are there has to be a, a visible foundation material around the edge because you'll notice nearly every house that was built in this area is propped up either because it has a crawl space or a basement 
and it really gives it this more heightened look. We are changing our approach to duplexes. Currently duplexes are considered a conditional use in the traditional neighborhood overlay. In the established neighborhood overlay, duplexes are not considered a conditional use, they're considered a permitted use. We had issues with duplexes that were very large, didn't really fit the traditional look, and one of the issues was just the massing of the structure. We tried to address that by having a very convoluted system of sizing the units differently, but what we found is that that interior square footage could easily be manipulated. So we have these massing requirements specifically for duplexes so that there has to be a variation in wall plane between the units or a variation in roof plane, basically creating a distinction between the units so that it's not one big monolithic structure. The second section in this article addresses manufactured home park design. These are standards that we have for manufactured or uh, what are more commonly called mobile home parks today. Not much is changing in this regard. It just establishes uh, kind of basic spacing requirements between homes for fire safety as well as street and sidewalk specifications, mainly to ensure that homes can be moved in and out of the park uh, with little trouble and that parks are walkable. And these are standards that we have today that we're merely adapting into this new code. A couple small changes to these standards is that we're requiring, we're requiring a certain amount of uh, common recreational space within parks. Uh, equal to about 8% of the park area. We're also introducing maintenance and management requirements that are similar to what we have today, but help to reinforce the, the quality of these communities. Probably the biggest change or improvement in this code is that we're uh, requiring a storm shelter for manufactured home parks that have uh, at least 25 units in them, which I think is a pretty critical safety feature for residents of those communities. <laughs> The third section in the residential design standards covers the redevelopment design overlay. This is an adaptation of the multifamily redevelopment overlay, if you're familiar, east of campus. And similar to the established neighborhood overlay, this modifies development to be more compatible and in this case encourages redevelopment with things like bonus densities um, and intensity of development. So it allows density in a part of the community where it's really needed, where students, uh, professors can be close to campus so that they can easily get to campus by say walking or biking as opposed to uh, having to drive all the way across town in order to get to campus. So if you drive around the area, you'll, you'll kind of see the type of development that is produced by this overlay. And it's not changing substantially uh, in the Manhattan Development Code. And what we found is that the multifamily redevelopment overlay has been very successful. In all, since it was created in 2003, there have been about 1,700 dwelling units constructed there but we did tweak a couple things in order to reduce friction in the development process so one of the basic goals as we kind of talked about in the established neighborhood overlay is to create compatibility with the older neighborhood development style and utility of the area and that largely comes down to creating a compatible scale so you'll see in this first column that there's actually a maximum building width depending on the housing type and maximum heights of building actually change as you go through the housing types from the least intense to the most intense. Today we have a minimum front yard setback of 14 feet with certain exceptions for architectural features such as porches, balconies, stoops. And in the new code, we're just tweaking that a little bit, taking that front yard setback down to 12 feet with those same exceptions for architectural features. And that's really to align more with the established neighborhood overlay because if the goal is to create compatible development with the older neighborhoods, it just made sense that those would match up. Everything else from interior side setbacks and rear setbacks and maximum building coverage Bridge aren't changing at all. Moving on to site design, similar to the established neighborhood overlay, there's a certain pedestrian utility that needs to be preserved in this area of town. So there are regulations associated with driveway width maximums, parking location, in order to enhance the pedestrian realm and maintain that walkability factor of this area. So parking is generally required in the backyard of properties and parking is prohibited from being located in the front yard. And that's not changing through this process. One thing about parking that we are changing is that parking minimums are being reduced from one space per bedroom down to three quarters of a space per bedroom. And this is based on pretty extensive field studies that we've conducted in the area and studies on trends in terms of car ownership among renters in Manhattan, along with a lot of supportive studies that have shown the effect of intensifying parking requirements on things like affordability and detriment of the urban environment. We're also permitting a new type of parking called podium parking or tuck under parking. This is typically seen when a building is constructed over a parking lot, either partially or fully. In this case, we would allow parking to be partially located underneath a building with proper screening requirements along the sidewalk and street. That way to someone looking by, it would just look like part of the apartment building. As far as landscaping, we're still requiring 15% uh, of a site to be made up of green space. And for similar reasons we talked about in the established neighborhood overlay, 
uh, we're requiring street trees for new development. And just like the established neighborhood, there are building design standards which are not changing much throughout this code. Um, they relate to orientation of the building, uh, certain architectural elements be required, building material minimums saying that a minimum portion of the facade has to be constructed of brick or stone, variation in wall planes to break up massing of buildings, minimum window area of 15%, roof pitch and eave overhang requirements, and ground floor entrance requirements. These are really the architectural and design elements that we see in these older neighborhoods that really make them compatible. The fourth section of the design requirements addresses factory built housing design. Uh, this is nothing new. Factory built housing is simply housing that is constructed or assembled in a factory or a warehouse that's shipped to the location and placed on a permanent foundation. And by law, uh, these home types are allowed to be anywhere that uh, site built homes are but we can require them to meet certain criteria so that they are compatible with the site built homes around them. And this just addresses very simple things like roof pitch, siding material, porch requirements, and anchoring requirements. And these are standards that we do have now. The fifth section of the design requirements addresses cottage villages. In the video for Article 2, we talked a little bit about that development type, and this is basically envisioned as a tiny house village development. These houses would be placed on a single property, which could have rentable or purchasable lots, similar to a manufactured home park, and this brings up special challenges in terms of ensuring basic quality standards for these developments, similar to mobile home parks. And the purpose of these developments is to encourage higher density, allowing smaller homes with shared facilities, which really helps in minimizing development costs and ultimately results in a affordability. So we just have a few standards for cottage villages, which includes minimum road widths, bicycle parking. We require one bicycle parking and one automobile parking space per dwelling in these developments. We also allow them to be located up to 500 feet away from the house. That way there can be efficiencies gained by creating shared parking lots instead of each individual house accommodating parking space. We do have spacing requirements for tiny homes, which requires them to be at least 12 feet apart with a minimum lot size of 1,000 square feet or three times the building footprint of the house, whichever is larger. And similar to the manufactured home parks, there is a common space requirement saying that at least 12% of the village has to be dedicated to shared or common space. The sixth section of the design standards address the urban core residential district. A little background on this district. This was a district created about four years ago. It's east of campus and just makes up a few blocks. But the idea is to encourage higher density, larger residential redevelopment projects with apartment buildings, typically three to eight stories tall, which can incorporate commercial uses on the ground floor. And not much is changing here, but we did have a few minor tweaks to iron out some minor bugs in the code to make it a little easier for the development of this area. One of the biggest modifications is that we're allowing tuck under parking with screening requirements, similar to what I talked about in the redevelopment design overlay district. We're also allowing a little bit more flexibility in terms of building design design standards. Specifically, we're allowing a wider range of materials to help keep up with more modern building style and construction techniques. So there's more flexibility in the mixture and uh, amount of materials that are required to be incorporated into the building design. And we'll still require minimum window area, uh, facade and, and roof line variation to help break up the massing and the scale of those developments. But largely everything else will stay the same. seventh and final section of the design standards addresses multiple family housing design and this is new to the code it provides standards on general multifamily development that is unless it's included in a special district or overlay creating a baseline for standards geared toward apartment complexes mainly addressing site and building design issues the main standard in this section require buildings to be front loaded on the site with parking more to the rear or internal to the site and this really helps screen parking, creating a more defined and pedestrian friendly streetscape. It also establishes standards for internal pedestrian networks for apartment complexes, which help feed into public sidewalks or trail systems, and requires a minimum of 15% of the site be dedicated to landscaping. And as far as building design standards go, it's pretty similar to the urban core residential district where you've got a list of materials that are of a certain quality that have to be used, but it's pretty flexible. And similarly to the urban core, there are building massing standards to help break up monolithic structures and give more variation to architectural style. So that covers the residential portion of the design standards found in Article 4. They help create a baseline standard for quality and development generally throughout the city, but also address the needs of special areas throughout town that have certain goals in terms of compatibility and redevelopment potential. We'll continue this section for non-residential design standards in our next video, which will be covered by my good friend John Adams.
So hang tight.